with uh, Speaker Pro Tem Paul Espinosa via telephone. Paul, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, gentlemen. Good to be with you this morning. Good morning. Great to have you uh, with us as well. Paul, before I get into last week, I want to ask you in regards to where uh, House Majority Leader Householder left off there in regards to a potential special session as being part of an interim session in August. Do, do you know off the top of your head the dates for that session in August, Paul? Well, uh, it's the uh, I'm trying to think it's the first week in August. Let me get my calendar up here in front of me uh, real quickly. Um, I think it's the I think Monday, I think might be August the 7th. So I think the interims begin uh, August the 6th, assuming that that uh, the 6th is uh, that's a Sunday is uh, is that Sunday. Yeah. So our regularly scheduled interims are the 6th, the 7th and the 8th. So typically, uh, if we do have a special session, uh, we would either convene uh, Sunday evening or more likely it would be on that Monday the 7th would be would, would we, we convene. And the idea would be that uh, hopefully if there's pretty broad agreement on whatever is scheduled to be on the call, that we could uh, convene on uh, likely that Monday, uh, August the 7th, perhaps uh, – send legislation to uh, one or more committees if necessary and, and accomplish that uh, on the 7th and then actually come back either later on the 7th or or early on the 8th and, and then wrap up that special session. Uh, again, uh, typically when there is a special session uh, in conjunction with legislative interims, uh, it, it we, we try to, to the extent that we can, uh, and we encourage the governor to limit the agenda items to topics where we think there's going to be pretty broad support, uh, and then we're uh, able to suspend our normal rules where you have to read a bill on three separate days. Uh, by a four-fifths vote of each chamber, you can't suspend that rule, and then uh, essentially, uh, and we have done this in the past, actually enact a piece of legislation in a single day if necessary. So that's more than likely the approach that we'll take. But again, just uh, still remains to be seen exactly where there will be sufficient support in order to, you know, have a uh, expedited uh, special session during our legislative interims. And in regards to the rules of a special session, the person who calls or the entity which calls for the special session uh, that, that they set the, uh, I think you said the call and, and, and that's only the, that's the only thing you can discuss is what's on that call. Correct. That's right. Uh, and, uh, in this particular case, and typically what we've, uh, what we've experienced as far as special sessions concern is that the governor will call us in the special session. And then, uh, the governor does, uh, specify that call. And, um, it's a, sometimes it's, uh, it's a little, uh, it's a little uh, disconcerting, I think, to, to some of us in the legislature when the governor can, will, will sometimes make that call just so, so tight, actually sometimes going as far as including the language of the legislation in the uh, the call. And so that's sometimes an, uh, a, uh, an effort by the governor to be very, very precise as to what uh, what can be considered. For example, when the governor called us in uh, the special session, I believe it was, oh, gee, I've lost a little track of time. I think it was probably last year when uh, he called us in the special session for the purpose of tax reform. Well, it wasn't as wide open as just saying, I'm calling you into special session to consider you know, tax reform. He actually uh, spelled out his idea for tax reform. And you'll recall that back then, we just frankly did not have the consensus between the House and the Senate to uh, or even with our own members to really, uh, you know, just look at one uh, proposed, uh, you know, tax relief uh, bill. And so uh, so anyway, that, that's sometimes that's just a little interplay between the governor and the legislature sometimes as to how precise they'll be. Uh, uh, suffice it to say, uh, Rob, that your most successful special sessions are going to be where there's adequate uh, preparation in advance. There's been discussion uh, between the governor's office in the House and the Senate to come to some general agreement as to 
you know, what we're going to try to enact during the special session. And I do know that there's been significant discussion here on uh, several topics, uh, including corrections, uh, also uh, some discussion as far as uh, providing uh, some portion of our surplus, uh, as we have in, in recent years, uh, provide some additional funding for road maintenance, perhaps some uh, some needed equipment for our uh, Department of Highways, as well as the, the whole issue of, you know, how we uh, help ensure that our volunteer fire departments in particular have the wherewithal to continue to serve their communities. Yeah. Paul, I'd like to come back to a volunteer fire department in just a couple of minutes, uh, a couple of seconds. Uh, but you mentioned it was special session. I always assumed the only one you could call special session was a governor, but you hinted or alluded to the fact that others could call special session as well. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, uh, uh, Bill. And, um, um, the legislature can call itself in the session, but that requires a, a supermajority vote in both the uh, House and the Senate. And I'm drawing a little bit, bit of a blank right now as, as we speak, uh, uh, Bill. Uh, it's either it, – I think it's two-thirds uh, of the House as well as two-thirds of the Senate would actually have to sign uh, a, a petition or otherwise inform the governor that – uh, we support the calling of a special session. Uh, so that can be done. Uh, it, it, historically, that's not typically what we've done. I think one of the concerns with calling ourselves in the session is that if we call ourselves in the session, then it, it pretty well becomes wide open as far as what can be discussed then, I mean, or what can be introduced. It becomes what, what we refer to as a plenary session, where it's just like having a regular legislative session uh, where uh, just legislation from any host uh, or re- regarding uh, pertaining to a wide uh, variety of, of topics can be can be uh, introduced and, and perhaps uh, considered. And so, I think there is there is some benefit. Uh, the, the 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 thinking has been uh, really ever since I've been in the legislatures that it's better. Uh, to try to come to some agreement with the governor as to what topics are going to be discussed during a special session so that we narrow the focus and and make it uh, more likely that we can accomplish uh, you know our set our set goals for a special session in a timely manner rather than having you know 134 legislators uh, basically involved in a in a uh, in a really uh, poorly defined, special session that could could drag on for days or weeks uh, you know at, at considerable cost to the taxpayer it's much better at least in our, in our estimation to understand very clearly what we want to accomplish and try to to the extent that we can and we typically have been able to accomplish that within the uh, time where we're already going to be in Charleston for for uh, for legislative entrance. Paul, let me very quickly carry us back to the conversation we had with Eric uh, Household a couple minutes ago, which I found to be very enlightening, and that's the volunteer fire department funding. Uh, the uh, and Eric uh, was uh, was clear and said there the difficulties like we have in many uh, bills, uh, the division between the growth counties and the non-growth counties, the the interest that each has. Uh, I'm a little curious that the funding, would it go toward health benefits, health insurance? Would it go for equipment? Would it go for transition of paid staff into the uh, to the volunteer? Uh, would the money go directly to the volunteer fire companies? Would it go to the county commissioners? I, there's just a host of questions that this uh, that's uh, that I, I find intriguing about this bill. Well, uh, uh, and I think uh, the the questions that you've described, Bill, are are questions that many of us uh, have as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the bill ultimately did not cross the finish line. Uh, uh, It was the topic of uh, considerable debate right up until uh, midnight on the last day of the legislative session. And again, I think uh, the questions that you've asked as well as uh, some of the questions that uh, uh, Majority Leader uh, Eric Householder uh, mentioned. I think those were all things that were kind of on, you know, in our mind, or just questions that we had. And so, uh, I know that uh, I do not serve on the uh, uh, committee uh, that that uh, reviews uh, this type of legislation, but I do know that 
a number of folks uh, have been meeting regularly to try to iron out some of those details. I tell you, um, I really uh, appreciate the leadership role that uh, House Finance Vice Chairman John Hardy took in really trying to put together a possible compromise uh, on this uh, issue because just as um, uh, Leader Householder described, and I just caught the tail end of Leader Householder's uh, comments, but but I've heard him discuss this before, I I think there are questions as to how we do this equitably. I mean, I can certainly appreciate uh, the challenges that our rural fire departments, particularly in some of these more rural areas of West Virginia, face in order to make sure that they have the equipment necessary, the supplies, and even the uh, uh, the building infrastructure that's necessary in order to maintain volunteer fire departments in some of these very rural areas. But uh, as uh, Vice Chairman Hardy, I, I know, has pointed out to me, and, and I think really helped educate me on this, on, on some of the inequities that even currently uh, 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 are experienced in this area, is that there is certainly a potential that uh, under some of the proposed legislation that a very rural county that has multiple volunteer fire departments could actually receive more funding than a very populated uh, area such as Jefferson or Berkeley County, uh, where uh, arguably the demand for services is much greater. And so how we do that equitably and also, as I think leader uh, Householder alluded to, make sure that there is some skin in the game for these counties to and their constituents to help with that funding through a through an ambulance fee or a fire fee uh again it's it's a it's a very complicated issue and uh and i appreciate uh vice chairman hardy and others uh who have really delved into this and are trying to come up with something that is equitable but also provides uh, that you know we'll have these services even in some of our more rural counties where, you know, uh, I have to acknowledge that it is a quite a bit of a challenge to cover some of these uh, very, very rural areas of West Virginia. Paul, this is John Gilstrap. Um, fire service, things are near and dear to me. I did that for a long time. Um, <clears throat> and if I could, the, the issue of, about rural firefighting versus the, I can't call Berkeley County urban, but, you know, the, the, the more growth counties, the farther, the longer it takes to get a fire truck to a fire, the bigger the fire is going to be, and therefore the more equipment there's going to need. So I urge people not to write off the needs of rural fire departments. It takes a long time, I'm going to guess, to get to the, the firefighters to the station, and then they've got to get to the scene, and then they've got to have water. And if they don't have water, they've got to have tankers, and all of that is, is expensive. But moving on from that, um, here in Berkeley County, um, I just had a very long interesting discussion with the uh, Berkeley County Fire Chief and, and some others. Um, at my house, it will take the run time, assuming the fire truck gets out the door right when the alarm sounds, is about eight and a half minutes. And that's with the career staff on duty. It volunteers, it's going to be whatever it takes to get to the station plus more. So basically, we don't have fire protection. We, if, if the, um, you get out and you watch the house burn, which, and I don't mean that in a uh, dismissive way. I mean, it's just the reality of it. And water is, is hard to get. And the fire, the, the, the replacement of the Beddington Fire Department is actually moving farther away from the residential areas and closer toward the more developed areas. So my question, I guess, is does the state have a role in providing funding for county fire stations and for providing um, paid staff for those fire stations, or is that strictly a, a, a jurisdictional county by county role? Does the state control that? Well, again, John, I, I'm not as well versed as perhaps some others on you know how the funding flows and so forth. But uh, it's my general understanding that as far as offering paid service, that would be a, a responsibility, uh, um, an initiative that would be undertaken by you know, the local county or an agency under local county. I mean, we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, some of that, uh, uh, a lot of the discussion, obviously, that's taking place in Jefferson County right now, where, you know, we do have a partially paid um, uh, uh, ambulance service, for example, and uh, yet we rely on volunteers for the firefighting aspect of that. And 
obviously there's some crossover between those responsibilities but you know that's uh, one of the uh one of the that, that's how Jefferson County's kind of structured it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure Berkeley County as well has a combination of paid and, and volunteers. But I think any paid staff would have to be done through a, a ambulance fee or a fire fee in order to accomplish that. I think, as I understand it, I think these dollars uh, are designed to again provide the equipment, uh, training. Uh, facilities, uh, some some support with the facilities, but uh, again, I, I, I certainly would be would uh, stand corrected uh, for folks that are more familiar with how those uh, funds flow. And there is uh, there is an existing uh, uh, revenue stream uh, that I, that I think uh, flows from uh, individuals when they uh, subscribe to homeowners insurance, for example. Uh, there is a, a fee that I believe associated with that now what the legislation that it was under consideration this last session would have adjusted those rates uh, uh, to provide some additional funding for uh, for the overall uh, volunteer fire services throughout the uh, throughout the state. I th- again, I think one of the concerns that many of us had here in the Eastern Panhandle was just how that would be distributed. It, it seemed as if um, it seemed as if areas you know such as uh, growth areas such as Jefferson and Berkeley County perhaps Mon County would be paying the lion's share of that just because it's based on the insurance uh, premiums that uh, folks are paying and obviously uh, you have more folks located here the home values are greater so it seemed uh, one of the concerns was is that uh, essentially these growth areas like Jefferson Berkeley County the eastern panhandle would be uh, funding to a large extent these services throughout the state, and those areas would be receiving a disproportionate share of that funding. Paul, I uh, just ran out of time to talk to you about uh, the uh, gathering in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, last week. So my apologies on that. Uh, we uh, needed to get a few questions about uh, the, the fire departments uh, hammered out here as we started in a conversation with Eric Carroll. So, so I appreciate your patience in, in dealing with uh, with those and your ability to answer as, uh, as best you could. So I, I thank you very much. And uh, maybe we can catch up soon about Charleston, South Carolina again next time. Sounds great. Happy to join you guys anytime. Thank you, Paul.